in particular, the concern here raised was the younger generation. We need more scientists is one of these emblematic uh, reports that have been written into that have been published in 2004 by a high level expert group showing that this is the threat to Europe's future if we do not manage to get in the key areas the next generation of scientists up who want to do this kind of work. We then move on to um, the science from science and to science in society which is an interesting contradictory shift because on the one hand uh, there, there is this idea that we should not treat them as separated things, we should treat them as kind of integrated things. And then at this, in the same area happens a renaming of the directorate from science and society to science, economy and society. And I was constantly making the joke that now the economy is the kind of meat in between the two breads of science and society. So the real important stuff has now come in and moved in between these entities who are so in, which are so intricately intertwined. They probably are this through economy. Um, and then we move on to the last, which is um, this kind of need for rethinking the innovation process. Why we could greet that in a sense, because it brings in this idea of the process, maybe more than, than just convincing people and, and making them know more about science. And by inventing again a new vocabulary, namely responsible research and innovation, it is very unclear where this animal goes, in the sense that it is unclear what responsible means in that sense, responsible towards whom, who would take responsibility. It's a very kind of generic thing, which if you want to read it positively, can open a space which needs filling and needs engagement. On the other hand, it's unclear what kind of things will be supported, because it's also unclear where the focus of science and society will leave. There is no special science and society uh, topic anymore. It should now be mainstreamed. Hmm. That is something which would need discussion. So um, what I, um, uh, maybe I explain still the very idea of the graphic is that any new layer does not make the pre-existing one disappear. And that's a really important idea, that just because we shift from science and to science in and whatever to responsible, this does not mean that certain logics that have been implemented in the framework of these kinds of thinking just vanish and get replaced by new ones. Um, the former layers have already put in place and continue to develop a set of standardized practices. The more we advance in the layering, the less we have well entrenched and clear sets of such practices at hand and to start working from. The value of this short description does, does not lie to, to tell you a story of a linear improvement from a very kind of um, communication driven linear model to a more complex one. But I propose to read it metaphorically as a stratigraphy of science and society policies. Over time, different layers of policy thinking were developed deposited and sedimented. They all have different uh, compositions, involve different kinds of sources, actors, and imaginaries of the science-society relations. Any new layer never simply replaces the pre-existing ones, but adds to them. Layers always coexist and interrelate. Previous ideals and approaches thus remain somehow present, while new perspectives and ways of seeing the problem are added and partly discursively overwrite, if you want so, previous conceptualizations. But as in any geological formation, pressures do not leave these orderly structures untouched. Pressures bring up some of the previous layers and make them more visible again. Brian Wynne's call, the deficit model is dead, long live the deficit model, is captured quite nicely such a moment when ideas declared as left behind, just reinvented under a new guise. So understand this as a kind of moving thing, as nothing that is stable, as given, but see it as something that is in work. I, I just like this background music. Uh, OK. Now, therefore, we always have to read these policy measures as in search for a better, a perfect setting. 
perfect in the sense that it addresses the policy ideals that are behind. And this is, of course, a tricky endeavor. By focusing on being an architect of science-society relation, it distracts us from the multi-located and messy processes in which such act interactions always happen. It distracts us from seeing the many bottom-up, hardly visible efforts to deal with techno-scientific innovation from the side of members of our societies. And it does not necessarily address the issue that, make sci that making science public is always an intervention. An intervention both, I argue, in making publics and in making science. And I will try to argue these two kinds of things. Both are largely left unacknowledged. Um, now let's start by making the good publics. And I used two uh, pictures that already nicely capture the tension I'm alluding to. Between the bottom up uninvited, to use Brian Wynne's distinction between invited and uninvited, participation in the debate over GM crops, and the obvious contradiction we encounter uh, in many of the invited forms of engagement and learning. It is perfectly captured in this cartoon. Be innovative, critically thinking public, but which does, not, which does what it is expected to do, like and support science and innovation. So let me capture some of the issues at stake. First, I would like to highlight the multiplicity of spaces of different kind in which members of a given society encounter science. A multiplicity which is then also reflected in the ways people address techno-scientific issues. Starting my thinking from those who have specifically been constructed and devoting to making science public, I have argued together with a colleague of mine that we should understand them as political machineries for making publics. They are always performative. These publics are made in the course of the process. They are selected according to specific criteria which we think a good public should look like with all our good intention we have in that, we, the, or the access is made such that certain parts of society feel more attracted than others. They contain specific scripts, to use Madeleine Eckridge's notion, uh, which comes out of technology studies. She says any technology has, in, has a, a script embedded, a way how we imagine that people should use the technology. And Whoever has ever done science engagement knows what we expect from our members of the public. How they behave, how they discuss, how they are active, how they, are, they like it, how they... We expect all these kinds of things. We choose people because we think, oh, this is an affected person, or whatsoever. Gender, age, we have all these wonderful categories which allow us to do our Lego building of participation. And I include myself. This is not a, a kind of external uh, criticism. It means giving rules and values. It means pointing to the rules and values in built in these settings, including a specific expectation that people would inhabit these spaces offered to them in the way the architects have conceived them. So we want them to behave in a civil way. We want them to debate. We don't want them to fight, we, et cetera, et cetera. So we think we know how the rules of the game are. Yet we also know that this doesn't happen. Description happens. So to use, again, Ackridge's term, description in the sense that people use these places in a different manner than we have foreseen that. We might be upset as researchers because they destroy us. Our wonderful design, we have spent so much time convincing the policy makers to give us money to do it. So they do not behave in exactly the way we want. But that is precisely where it gets interesting. That's precisely where we can learn something from. It's about this kind of inhabitation policies people kind of um, develop. Um, so in a sense, we could thus, thus understand these kinds of settings as laboratories for addressing science-society relations as kind of delimited spaces with selective access. So even the uninvited ones are a selective access. Not everybody can participate in everything. Um, and as certain rules and protocols, re they reconfigure both science and society. And it's a place where power relations get expressed in a very particular way. 
These have different forms and formats, which I try to express with what my computer allows me to express in a visual manner, to say that clearly. That's my technological description. Yet, but by focusing so much on these explicit spaces, neither policymakers nor analysts recognize and appreciate sufficiently, I would argue, what has been happening regarding science and society at multiple uncontrolled and uncontrollable bottom-up spaces. In particular, the emergence of the World Wide Web did not only offer the possibility for collecting and rearranging information, but also offered numerous alternative ways of expressing a position, of negotiating over positions, of kind of posting uh, um, ways of seeing the world. It seems essential thus that public participation research and practice should take into account these different formats of participation much more than we do so far. Maybe it's this idea of having an uncontrolled territory which makes us nervous being socialized as researcher, where control is one of these ideas that allows us to believe that then evidence is better at the end of the day. The call is thus for bringing public participation, which is already happening, to the attention of policy, but also to attention of social science research. Um, yet societal actors are not only simply out there, as I said, but are reconfigured in specific ways through such, seti such engagement settings. They create particular roles for exchange agents, I would call them, or experts of communities, as Nicholas Rose called it, which means people holding or claiming to hold the expertise to foster, organize and imagine such interaction processes. What this kind of expertise could be is a highly relevant question when one looks at the flourishing market around science communication that has considerably grown of, over the last years. So it's a really very, very dispersed um, crowd that does uh, very, very, very different things. Would we expect a different new kind of expertise if they are to be so important actors in making science public and in making it into a public good. But it is also interesting to look at what I call the engagers. And the engagers is a much wider notion than those participating in an engagement exercise, because I do think engagement has different forms and formats and should be seen in a much broader way than we generally tend to do it. Regular reading of, of newspapers on, on, of debates, going to museums, whatsoever, is a form of engaging with these kinds of topics, although we don't call it an engagement. So it's the question is like, what's happening to those who, who actually do, in a more or less continuous way, um, do, uh, do think and address uh, these um, so I think people devoting time and thinking about I issues related to science and society should as much be at the focus of our interest as those really explicitly participating in the few engagement exercises. From many years of working in, si in the science of so and society field, for doing focus groups, discussion settings of different kinds, but also interviews and observations, I've seen so many different forms in which the public comes into being they get performed and perform themselves as individual choice agents, so claiming that it's up to them anyway to do it or not to do it when it comes to buying or not buying GM food, for example, in form of fluid groups that are held together by different context-bound features or, or, or co-produced with putting at the center certain issues where people can gather around or they are well-delimited constituencies already, claiming that they speak for f women, children, or whatsoever. Um, and of course, the abstract entity, the public, which is there as the ghost, one could say, and the, in, the, in, the, in the imagination of people. The latter is not a monopoly of policymakers, but also participants themselves construct their own identity through constructing the nameless others, which they call the public out there. They are not as interested as they are. They are not as engaged as they are. They're not as knowledgeable as they are. So there's a continuous kind of boundary work going on, defining yourself and defining the others. 
And positioning towards an issue actually also engages work to construct yourself in relation to others, to create alliances and elaborate, be they virtual or in the room, and elaborate on distinctions. In short, to create at least momentarily thought collectives, to use Ludwig Fleck's term, which might support your idea, your decision, your choice. To understand this part of the dynamic is essential to understand cultural differences when it comes to addressing techno-scientific innovations. All that happens in what I call a technopolitical um, culture, which brings an, a number of issues to the fore. Technopolitical cultures um, are characterized, to my view, or in my thinking, by at least seven features. Um, first, it can be characterized by a preferred way of arranging and articulate and regulating the technological and the social. This can have sectorial variations, evidently, as well as by broader pervasive socio-technical imaginaries, to quote Sheila Jasinov's term. This would be in the Austrian case, for example, that certain kinds of technologies which are seen as threatening what gets an important part, understood as important part of the identity, can be collectively banned. Nuclear energy, GMOs, and other issues have been there. So this is a piece of identity work and through, through arranging technological and the technological and the social. Technopolitical cultures are framed by a set of myths and widely shared storylines about technology and society, which is related to the way memory practices are played out. In Austria, this is related to the above mentioned cases of rejection, of the potential rejection of technology. And this is often referred to as a best practice case by people of the fact that we have choices and we can choose despite the fact that everybody else seems to think that this is the best way to go down. I'm not, I'm not making a judgment now whether or not this is an intelligent way of handling it, but this describes a technopolitical culture. Third, a technopolitical culture is about values and valuing practices related to techno-scientific de developments. And here it's essential to see how they relate to practices of evaluating techno-scientific developments. And there is a huge discrepancy here between valuing and evaluating that becomes apparent when, you, when we think about science for the public good. For any technopolitical culture builds on a set of political practices which are recognized as legitimate and can be expected to play out when it comes to technological developments in society. Here we could say, is citizens' participation a recognized form of political action? Is it just an add-on, strange thing? And can we expect that these citizens are ready being, do, doing being a citizen, as Mike Michael has so nicely uh, framed that? That is a very complicated issue in the Austrian context where we have a representative idea of, of the social partner speaking for society. And so this is very difficult to kind of bring that into the political culture. Five, having, not, having or not having specific institutions that accompany technological change. The famous example of the Danish Board of Technology, which has created some excitement over the last year, or the German Office of Technology Assessment, would be such institutions. But technopolitical culture, to my view, is also described by the way um, technological change is addressed in the public arena, like media discussions, critical media discussions, and other things, civil science, civil society organizations. And, and finally, Technopolitical culture is defined through its imagination of how the local can be intertwined with the regional and the global. So how the local gets a voice. In, and this is in, in the European context. You see that in the Austrian case, joining Europe in 95, you see that as a, as a growing concern about how can you keep specificities and what is your role in this kind of collective game. 